here we are. Okay, welcome friends. I want to introduce to you someone, a friend, a person who's made a big difference in many people's lives, who's brought a lot of clarity to realms of parenting, realms of addiction, realms of expanding consciousness through using medicine plants, many realms that you've been, how to, how to, how to deal with the hardcore real issues of life. So I want to welcome Dr. Gabor Maté. Thanks for being here this morning. Thank you, Sakya. So this is a private group of my friends. And so I thought I'd just really just check in for those of folks who don't know much about you or haven't been touched by your work. Would you mind giving a little share about your background and perhaps what, you know, things that might be pertinent for us? <laughs> um, That's a big one. I know you've had, you've tracked a lot of life experience. I can sum it up. So I'm a retired medical doctor. I left medical practice 12 years ago. No, sorry. Um, nine years ago. Um, I was in family practice. I did palliative care work. So basically I delivered babies and looked after dying people and everything else in between. And then for 12 years, I worked in Vancouver's downtown east side, which as you know, is a highly addicted, uh, charged, uh, traumatized populations. I was a physician there, including at the first supervised injection site that North America has ever seen. And um, in all my work, I, I, what I'm interested in is the unity of things. So I began to notice in family practice that who got sick and who didn't wasn't accidental, that, that, that people's emotional lives and life histories played into the diseases that then they developed, whether from cancer to autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, ALS, multiple sclerosis. And what struck me was the gap between my medical education on one hand and what I was observing on the other and the scientific literature, which really supported my observations that mind and body can't be separated, that the emotions are not distinct from our physiology that our life histories uh, show up in our mental and physical illnesses. And so there's really a striking gap between clinical observation on my part, science on the one hand, and on the other hand, what I was taught in medical school and how medicine is practiced. And then when I worked with addictions, it's the same thing. So addiction is, is seen as a, a brain disease that people mostly genetically um, acquire. But really what I found is that addiction had everything to do with people's lives, how much they'd suffered, uh, the trauma that they'd experienced, how that trauma shaped their brains, and how that trauma then gave them so much pain that they had to escape into addiction. So we're not talking about a disease, we're talking about a coping mechanism mm. that then creates its own problems, of course. And it looks like a disease in many ways. And yes, it affects the brain, but the other big piece that's missing from medical education is that the brain itself is a social organ. In other words, I'm not making this up, um, been published in many books and publications, but the point is that the brain is shaped by the environment, especially in the early years, beginning in uterus. So the more stress and trauma people experience, the more likely their brains are gonna be programmed to look for addictive behaviors or substances to regulate themselves none of which can be separated from the society that we live in. Because if you look at, for example, at the current uh, COVID crisis, yes. who's striking mostly? Uh, disproportionately striking people of color, people who are oppressed, people who are poor. Why? Because these are the people under the most stress. In other words, social stresses, economic structures, um, um, politics, they all affect families, they all affect individuals. They all either soothe or create stress. In other words, it's all one, which is not news to anybody who's followed spiritual teachings for the last 3,000 years. The difference is that scientifically we now know that is the case. So what has my work been about? It's about the unity of everything and about not looking at people through just one dimension, but, but from a multidimensional point of view. So that's what I can sum up. Beautiful. Thank you, Gabor. This is understood in the Eastern philosophies and the, in the healing philosophies of the East, that we are one 
symbiotic, systemic experience, everything inside and out. So in this Western world, are you, can you share with me, is there any improvement? Is there more of this holistic viewpoint that's starting to spread or be accepted in the medical communities? Well, in practice, almost, well, the answer is yes, there's movements within the medical profession, like integrative healing and, and so on, where they do take an account more of the unity of things. But I would say it's still baby steps. The average medical student does not get this information, even though the science is not even controversial. Like you, you can show how you can stress animals or people when they're pregnant and, and how that's going to change the genetic functioning of their infants, maybe for a lifetime. Not the genes, but how the genes function. But this information is not yet taught in most medical schools. And um, for the most part, physicians are taught to look at things just from the biological point of view. So if you have a mental illness, it's because there's an imbalance of chemicals in your brains. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's because your immune system has somehow attacked your body. But what is causing the imbalance of chemicals, which is your life, and what is causing the immune system's assault on the self, which is lifelong stress and childhood trauma and, and how they affect the physiology, that's not taught. And therefore, most people, when they go see a doctor with a headache, with an inflamed joint, with asthma, with a malignancy, with inflamed intestines, with depression. Um, most of the time, they're not going to be asked about childhood traumas or stresses, present day stresses. They're not going to be asked, how do you feel about yourself as a person? Um, but what are your relationships like? They're not going to be asked those questions. They'll be given them the physical, the physiological treatments, but the larger picture will be uh, ignored for the most part. Now there are exceptions, but yes. I'm talking, you know. So for those of us who are experiencing these things, many of us have had all types of traumas growing up, all types of compromised circumstances growing up. The questions that you just asked, how am I? What's my relationship with myself? How's my upbringing? What traumas have I had that are perhaps afflicting me now? How can someone start that path to take more acceptance and responsibility to have a holistic view or movement or start to regain health um, that, the, that the current system doesn't necessarily look at or expand? How can one start that? Sure. So one of the books, I, what I didn't mention is I've written four books and one of the books I've written is called When the Body Says No. And so um, the cost of hidden stress, that's the Canadian title. Um, exploring the disease, stress disease connection is the US subtitle. But when the body says no. So let's say you get a headache. Let's say you get a low back pain. Let's say you um, get frequent colds. Let's say you get stomach aches. Let's say you have trouble sleeping, dry mouth. Let's say you have uh, stomach pains. Let's say you have a flare up of multiple sclerosis. You could ask yourself, what is my body saying no to that I'm not saying no to? Because that's what it really is happening. And usually it's some stress that you take taken on automatically because you were programmed to take on stress as a child. So it seems normal to you. But your body's saying no, it's enough. So you can begin with that question of what is my body saying no to that I'm not saying no to. That's a good point of inquiry. Great question. Yeah. So you start to contemplate that. From my experience, the body gives us answers. Yeah. There's an innate intelligence. There's a profound innate intelligence. And there's also, from my experience, a natural GPS direction system. But it's not necessarily in words. Can you share more about that, please? Well, so there's a wonderful book on trauma, which is called The Body Keeps the Score by um, Bessel van der Kolk, who's a trauma psychiatrist. And um, other book, When the Body the body Remembers, also about trauma. So the point is that <clears throat> the body does keep the score. 
So the first thing is to reconnect with our bodies. Now, one of the impacts of trauma, and I mean, one of the possibilities that this COVID vacation has given people willy-nilly is people have more time on their hands than they actually want. Well, you could use this time. You know, so one of the things you can do is to reconnect with your body. So whatever, there's ways to do that, you know, but the point is to really pay attention to what's happening in my body right now. And, and, and what is that trying to tell me? And if you spend enough time with the question, if you paid attention, you'll get the answer. It'll just come up, you know, and it usually has to do with how you're driving yourself when you don't need to be. Well, underneath that drive, there's a belief. Um, it usually has to do with relationships. When your relationships, when you're suppressing your true emotions and your true self, and you don't say no because you're afraid to lose the relationship, yes. you're saying no, this is not good for you. So it's a question of touching with the body, paying attention to it. It's such a simple question, but so powerful and profound. You know, what's my body saying no to? And the other half of that is? Well, then, the other half is, why is my body having to say it? Why am I not saying it? And uh, so what's my belief? Yeah. So there's a belief. If I say no, um, I'm a bad person. Or if I say no, I won't be lovable. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so lovability has to do with acceptability. Yes. Um, so where did you learn that? Well, you learned that as a child. So what happened in childhood that taught you that to be lovable, you have to be acceptable to other people. If you're yourself, your true emotions, you're not lovable. We learned that somewhere. We all, unfortunately, Satyam, we all learn that. Pretty much we all learn that. Absolutely. More in this culture. Yeah. So Gabor, if we look at society from a macro level, right? Overall, there's times I feel so frustrated. I feel we need a complete societal reboot. This is a very precious time during this COVID fiasco where we're all in. And who knows if there'll be a total complete systemic overview and reboot, you know, things, little things change, something stay the same. What do you feel as a society, as a whole, that we can do to reboot so that society as a whole uplifts in their physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health? What are some of the main areas that we need a rebooting or redefining? Well, look, so um, even to talk about society, what do we need to do as a society? <clears throat> it assumes that we exist as some group with a unitary purpose. But that's not my assumption. My assumption is that actually this is a class-ridden society. Mm. People actually who, who, who exercise power and, and who possess wealth and who make decisions in their own interests that have nothing to do with genuine human, human interests. For example, whose interest is it to promote more fossil fuel production and, and consumption? But well, not of the earth, not of human health, not of the of climate health. But somebody does find it profitable, otherwise it wouldn't be happening. And these people happen to be making the decisions. So when you say society, like first of all, we have to recognize what kind of society we live in. Yeah. And the society we live in is not one of equality and of um, communal. Um, decision-making. Uh, there's an article in the Guardian newspaper from England this morning about will COVID change capitalism? You know, because look at, look, look, at, look at this materialistic society that says that wealth and acquisition and attainment and uh, achievement and admiration, these are the things that really matter. Okay, so, um, Three months ago, if I pointed out to you that in Canadians, First Nations communities, there's a lot of poverty, historical abuse, poor food, 
lack of potable water. And if I would have said, we need to we do, there was some resources here. Politicians would say, oh, uh, we can't, we don't have the resources. All of a sudden, there's trillions of dollars. For example, the Canadian government is gonna give $1.7 billion to oil companies to clean up the unused wells that are polluting that they didn't have the money to clean up. All of a sudden, there's money available. Well, how come there wasn't the money available four months ago to help the First Nations communities? But these are not accidental um, decisions. They, they, they represent the nature of the system. So the real question is, will enough people recognize that that system just doesn't work for human beings? No. And I don't know. And of course, that's also a question of who, who generates or who moderates the conversation. Well, most of the media is in the hands of very few people. And this is not conspiracy, I'm just stating a fact. Absolutely, yeah. Will, will those people have a great interest in really exploring the nature of the system? So it's possible that there'll be some reforms. I mean, during the Great Depression and the Second World War, you had a very different kind of economy. Yes. And, 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 and there was much, and, and, and the social safety net was established and, and um, there was a time when companies were taxed a lot more than they are now in order to support the social safety net. Is it possible we'll go back to that? Uh, this, is, this system is quite clever at surviving. So it, it, we might go back to more, more of a, a social accord, but I, I can't presume that. I believe there has to be enough swell of intolerance, not just this passive tolerance. It needs to be a swell of collective intolerance of the injustice of how us as humans are treated and how all the interests are moving towards those which already have great strings of power and control. And <clears throat> very few people in positions of power and control want to relinquish their power and control. In fact, underneath duress and stress, they want to grab onto it even more. And unfortunately, yeah. even our governmental systems are really tied in to appeasing those interests first and foremost, because there's strings and attachments and wheeling and dealings and, and, and potentials of benefit after one's in office. And this is, it's, it, it's sick. It's a sick, it dark. Um, and, and unfortunately, many people feel they don't have any power because They've been traumatized. Many people feel, what good is it to collectively aim to try to have justice come around? What, what, what's your thoughts and feelings around that? How can we as a, people who are not in those positions of pulling the strings, what are some wise ways that we can come together and start making a little incremental shifts to regaining our fairness and sovereignty and taking care of the whole? Well, people's sense of powerlessness in, like, like, in the society is very real. If you look at the elections, how many people actually vote? And and voting itself is a pretty minimal thing. I mean, you get to draw a mark on a piece of paper every four years and between a very narrow range of, uh, of candidates. I'm going to say narrow in terms of very narrow ideological range or, or very narrow range of, of social views. You know, there are some differences, but the differences never extend to questioning the system itself. Exactly. You know, now, but even that minimal act of self-determination, which is to say, go and vote, how many people actually take part in it? Like in the municipal elections, the vast majority don't. Why don't they? Because they don't think it makes any difference. They actually have been disem disempowered. Now, why the, in fact, if you look at the wealthier parts of town, people vote more than they do in the poorer parts of town. Damn good reason for that. Because in the wealthier parts, people feel they have more power. Because the system gives them power. You know, now, um, so that, that, that disempowerment has 
two bases to it. One is, as you say, is trauma. The more traumatized you are, the less empowered you feel. And there's a lot of people are traumatized in this society. When as a child, you were not paid attention to and your emotions were not respected, you essentially experience your powerlessness. Your, your first power arises because people recognize your needs and they meet your needs. Oh, I must be good. I must be worthwhile. Hey, I'm powerful, you know. But if that doesn't happen, if simply your parents don't pick you up when you're crying and you need their contact. Yes. Or they feed you on demand because the doctor said to feed every four hours rather than when a kid, you know. You immediately have a deep sense of powerlessness and unworthiness. And this goes right to the heart of people's sense of powerlessness. Oh, so that's yeah. one thing, let alone if you're abused and, 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 and mistreated and so on. But the other force of, source of powerlessness is actually embedded into the system. Uh, people are, take a simple issue. Um, boy, we're far away from COVID, but, but, take, a, but take a simple issue. Canada's mission to Afghanistan which according to the polls, this is the Canadian army going to Afghanistan. Most people in Canada supported it. Now, if you ask the Afghan Canadian, tell me where Afghanistan is on the map. What are the, what are the surrounding countries? Tell me two minutes summary of something about the history of Afghanistan in the 20th century or the 19th century. Who are these people? What could they have told you? Nothing. Yes. So based on zero information, they decide that our soldiers should go and kill and die in Afghanistan. Based on what? I mean, even if it's the right decision. Yes. It's only accidentally the right decision. In other words, what I'm saying is that people, for the most part, are... And if you ask most the average person uh, about uh, the economics of oil, and um, the possibilities of a fossil fuel free economy. Ask them to speak two minutes about what they know about that. What would you hear? Nothing. And this is not because people are stupid, but because this society has so many ways of confusing people and not giving them the information and of diverting us. Like the average person has heard far more conversation on who should the Maple Leafs draft in the next NHL player selection than on the basis of the economy and does it really make any sense? So people are diverted, distracted, confused, uninformed. So of course. It's like the opiate of the masses, that whole machinery is on oh, full force right now. Yeah, well, so Karl Marx said in the 19th century that religion is the opiate of the masses. And uh, of course it can be. Um, spirituality can be the wake up call of the masses, but religion can be the opiate. But, but now we have lots of opiates because religion has now receded. So now we have sports and now we have entertainment and the internet and all these things, highly addictive stuff. So people are basically- And designed, and designed to be highly addictive. They're designed to be addictive, yeah. For well, sure they are, yeah, yeah. So, um, so when you say, how will society change after this? Well, it depends to what degree people are going to wake up. Maybe we'll, maybe a lot of people will wake up. I doubt it. But maybe a lot of people will wake up to the fact that it really doesn't matter who wins the damn Stanley Cup. Or, which is not to say we shouldn't enjoy the sports, we shouldn't enjoy watching them, but all the energy and time. Yes. What we prioritize. What we prioritize. Yeah. Of deepest human value. Yeah. You know, what you've shared here is, is, is so valuable, how to come back from this opiate state of being yeah. numbed and moving towards entertainment and some type of constant stimulation. So we're not really feeling, as you said, the voice of the body, the inner knowing. Now, I know a few years back, you took a, a deep dive, a journey into plant medicines, ayahuasca medicine. For those of you who don't know, ayahuasca is a sacred plant medicine that comes from uh, the jungles of the Amazon and all through and now all over the world. And I have found this, you know, I've been leading groups, taking groups to Peru for over, you know, 25, 30 years now, diving into that medicine and other forms of medicine. 
And I found it to be such a very profound, in the right context, in the right application, a very powerful way to start to come out of that slumber of what have I been in, or how have I been deluding myself. It's a, it's a truth wake-up call is what I've experienced. Would you be kind enough to share about your experience with that and perhaps how that could be a possibility for friends here to be able to start to see the bigger picture or the inner picture? Well, so after my book on addiction came out um, in the realm of hungry ghosts, in which I made the case that addiction is not a disease, it's a, it's a normal, it's, it's a natural escape from pain. And, and that people underlying it is, is in every single case trauma. And I was on book tour. This is in 2008. And uh, almost everywhere I went, somebody would put their hand up and say, well, what do you know about ayahuasca and healing addiction? And I'd say nothing, I don't know anything about it. And the next time, what do you know about ayahuasca? And I said, nothing. And I find the question annoying. I said, leave me alone already. I've just written, spent three years writing a book on everything I know and not asking about what I don't know. You know? <laughs> And then it so happened that somebody said, well, you know, maybe you want to try it. And um, as you might be aware, it was with your assistance that I had my first ayahuasca experience. And it was at our place. We were very honored to host you at our yeah. place here. Well, I, you know, I, yeah, I didn't want to say it was at your place in case you get into trouble, but yeah. Okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> And I had this beautiful experience that in, in that tent, the very first night. Uh, there was a baby in the room. Yes. There was a couple, and this baby was crying and gooing and cooing. And I just had these tears of love. Um, moving down my face and, and I, I got in touch with a deep love that I never experienced. And, um, but I also saw, that was the first night, and I said, this is great. I came back for the next, uh, next night, it was sheer hell. Yeah. And um, so I got it. This plant can show you all the hell that you're carrying inside and all the love that you're not aware of that you're carrying inside as well. Yes. So right then and there, I decided, yeah, I can work with this. And then I started to. So you've emphasized the right context, and that's absolutely essential. Now I have to say, <clears throat> this is not a criticism, but from my point of view, what was missing at that event at your place was the lack of integration. And there was, it was a beautiful experience. And the people leading it were just lovely, lovely people with amazing musical skills and, and big hearts. But in terms of, I, I thought people need more guidance here because um, so much comes up. Yes. That needs processing, that needs some expert processing, some guide, some guidance. So I then decided to work with some Iowa and <clears throat> create these events where we would have the guidance and the ceremony and the, the pre-ceremony guidance and the post-ceremony processing. Yes. Which is how a lot of people are doing it these days. Yes, it's essential. Yeah, yeah. It's essential to have the grounding and the integration and yeah. how, how these higher states will be yeah. lived and grounded into everyday life and relationships and reality. Absolutely. That's right. So since then I've worked with it and I've seen some amazing transformations in people in terms of dealing with their addictions, their physical illnesses, their health, their mental health issues, just their lack of meaning in their lives, looking for their real selves. So yeah, it's an amazing modality uh, in the right context. I also have to say, as you're probably aware as well, uh, and you emphasize the context, Sometimes people move into these places very vulnerable, very open, and they get exploited, yes. including sexually exploited uh, by some shamans. So the context is everything, and uh, you have to do due diligence. And and I've really enjoyed, enjoyed is not the word, I've more than appreciated working with these plants, and, and I've got a lot from them personally. However, I'm not an ev evangelist for them, and for the simple reason that it's going to take something much bigger to change the world. And at any given time, only a relatively few of us will have access to these plants. Yes. Even if you opened it up, much more, right now it's illegal, of course, but even if you open in North America for some stupid reason, I mean, that's a whole other discussion. 
but but even if you opened it up in terms of time and money and resources and just availability of the plant itself it's always it's always going to be only a minority who have access to it so we can't look to these plants to somehow transform the world i do think they're a wonderful modality you know it's from what you're sharing, my experience is, is that society is moving along as it moves. Yeah. You can have a big interest in society. I do, you do. We have an interest in having it bloom in the long term. At the same time, facing the realities of this is a tough slog. It's not just some magical pie in the sky. We're going to have some magic dust. Some five dimension will come in and all of a sudden we'll be saved. I believe these type of thoughts, although altruistic and beautiful and give some type of hope there's also delusion in it and i feel that until we actually are willing to take on the personal path of our own freedom you know and okay where am i trapped where am i traumatized where have i been wired in a way that's not expressing my fullness of who i can be now it's taking on that if you will warrior's journey finding the sage of the wisdom within being strong within oneself and saying okay this is society, but I'm not. I, I'm, I'm feeling an intolerance to the way I'm currently living, and, I, and 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 allowing ourselves to feel that, and using that as this fuel to move beyond the matrix, if you will, to 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 find enough energy, enough angst in yourself to say, I can be free. Let me find freedom, and that path, that that turning that, if you will, fed upness of what's going on in one's personal life, and using that as fuel to break free from the collective dream break free from the collective orwellian automatic robotic life i think this is really valuable my encouragement to everyone listening here is to take that take that opportunity now in this covid time to find where are you tolerating what are you not tolerating what should you no longer be tolerating what can you be tolerating even more and that's going to strengthen our resolve to come out to strengthen our lives, to attain more freedom. And that naturally affects everyone around us. When we're more free in ourselves, our friends want to know, what are you doing? How are you more free? What's going on over there? So this is, I feel, a very potent time. If we wish, if we wish to take it rather than collapse in it. What's in your heart to share, to complete with us today, Gabor? What would you? Uh, as I was telling you last week, when you contacted me about this call. Uh, I'm writing a new book. And um, the title is The Myth of Normal, Illness and Health and in an Insane Culture. Um, but so I'm looking at the whole picture here. But as I was also telling you, I've, I've been having some real panic about writing the book. And um, like, I'm not up for this and, and this is too much and I can't do it and, and so on. And what you just said, makes me think, well, maybe that panic, and I've started talking to a therapist about it, and it's been actually quite helpful, and she's had some you know, deep insights. But as you were talking just now, I was just thinking, well, what am I not tolerating here? Like, like, like what wants to be freed up, in, like that panic, if I don't see it as a problem, I mean, I hate, I don't like it, let me tell you, I don't like it. But if I don't see it purely as a problem, but as a message from my body, from my soul, how can I possibly be listen to? How can I possibly listen to it? And, and what can I learn from it? And, and I think the same thing is true with whatever we're, anybody's experiencing these days. Yes, we, we could see it as a problem, something to get rid of or get through, or we could see it as well. What is there to be learned here? So. Um, yeah, as I was saying to you, um, when you write books and you give speeches and you have a certain reputation, people think you've got the answers to life, you know? But that's not how I'm experiencing it. <laughs> We're all in it together. Yeah. You have been square one. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Gabor, thank you so much for taking the time here. Thanks for making an impact in our lives and thanks for doing the inner work and continuing to do the inner work so that we all can improve. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Satyan. Great right. to see you. Be well. Much love. Thanks, everyone.